The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Everyone has heard of the fabulous goose that laid the golden eggs, but trust Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to ring some changes on that story when he sends the world's favorite detective, Sherlock Holmes, on a wild goose chase. Mr. Breckenridge, I was recommended to you by the landlord of the Alpha. He says that you have the finest geese in town. Oh, yes. I sent him a couple dozen last week. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to know where you got them. And I shall tell you. I've never been so pestered in my life. Where are the geese? Who did you sell them to? What did you take for the geese? I'm through answering questions about the geese. So get out and take your friend with you. Our mystery drama, The Adventure of the Blue Carbuncle, was adapted from the Sherlock Holmes classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Murray Burnett. And stars Kevin McCarthy. It is sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. So many of the Sherlock Holmes stories begin in that famous flat at 221B Baker Street that we overlook one obvious fact. The address is so well known, we assume everyone knows exactly where Baker Street is. And somehow I think that's a mistake. For those of you who've never been in London, let me place Holmes' headquarters more exactly. Baker Street runs from Regent's Park to Hyde Park. At the southern end, near Marble Arch, is the site of the United States Embassy. And so halfway between Regent's Park and Hyde Park, we join Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson at 221 Baker Street. And it wouldn't be amiss to wish them both a Merry Christmas. The second morning after Christmas, 1893, I'd called upon my friend Sherlock Holmes with the notion of wishing him the compliments of the season. But I found him intently examining a very disreputable and seedy, hard felt hat. Seeing him thus occupied, I said... Oh, well, if you're engaged, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. Oh, my dear Watson, I'm delighted to have a friend with whom I can discuss my results. Oh. The matter of this hat is perfectly trivial, but there are some points of interest. Uh, I, I suppose it's the clue which will guide you to the perpetrator of some crime. <laughs> no, no, no crime. This trophy belongs to Peterson, the commissioner of the club. You know him? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Is it his hat? No, 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 no. Peterson found it. The owner is unknown. Oh, well, how did you get it? Well, I received it on Christmas morning in company with a good fat goose, which I have no doubt is roasting at this moment over Peterson's fire. Well, what what are you bothering with it at all for? Come, come, Watson. You know my interest in even the smallest of problems. Peterson brought it and the goose to me under circumstances that piqued my curiosity. Well, you certainly succeeded in whetting my appetite to know more. How did Peterson come by the hat and the goose? Interestingly, he was returning home from a party about four o'clock Christmas morning. In front of him, he saw in the gaslight a tallish man walking with a slight stagger carrying a white goose slung over his shoulder. As he reached the corner of Gould Street and Tottenham Court Road, a row broke out between this stranger and a gang of tops. Oh, dear, I see. In the fracas, he lost his hat. Mm -hmm, Yes. One of the rowdies knocked off his hat, and whereupon the man raised his stick to defend himself. But swinging it over his head, he smashed the shop window behind him. (laughs) Dear me, an unfortunate way to celebrate Christmas. There's more misfortune to follow. Peterson ran forward to protect the stranger from his assailants. But the man, shocked at having broken the window, and seeing an official-looking person in uniform rushing towards him, dropped his goose, took to his heels, and vanished. (laughs) And the tufts? also fled at the appearance of Peterson, so that he was left with the spoils of battle, this battered hat, and a most 
unimpeachable Christmas goose. <laughs> Which surely he restored to the owner. My dear fellow, there lies the problem. It's true there was a small card tied to the bird's left leg on which was printed for Mrs. Henry Smith. It's likewise true that the initials H.S. are legible upon the lining of this hat. But there are some thousands of Smiths and quite a few hundreds of Henry Smiths in this city of ours. It's not easy to restore lost property to the rightful one. I see. Huh. What happened to the goose? I kept it until this morning when there were signs that... In spite of the slight frost, it should be eaten without delay. Oh, I Therefore, it's now roasting on the hearth of the finder while I have the hat. Uh, well, didn't this Smith advertise? No. Oh. Then you have no way of establishing his identity. Only as much as we can deduce from the hat. Oh, you must be joking. What in the world can you gather from this old battered felt? <laughs> hmm. Here's my lens. You know my methods? What can you gather yourself as to the individuality of the man who has worn this article? I took the tattered object in my hands and turned it over rather ruefully. All I could see was that it was a very ordinary black hat, much the worse for wear. The lining had been of red silk, but was much discolored. There was no maker's name. I, I saw the initials. There seemed to have been some effort to hide the discolored patches by smearing them with ink. Well, I handed it back, saying, well, I, 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 I see nothing else. On the contrary, Watson. You see everything, but you fail to draw inferences. All right. Then you tell me what you can infer from that hat. The man was fairly well-to-do within the last three years, although he has now fallen upon troubled days. He has foresight, but less now than formerly pointing to a moral retrogression, which, when added to the decline of his fortunes, seems to indicate some evil influence, probably drink. Oh, this may also account for the obvious fact that his wife has ceased to love him. Oh, my dear Holmes. Uh, I never heard such flights of fancy. Mm -hmm. He has, however, retained some degree of self-respect. He leads a sedentary life, is middle-aged, has grizzled hair, which he has cut within the last few days, and he uses lime cream on his hair. Of course. Just you must be joking. Also, by the way, it's extremely improbable that his home is lighted by gas. Oh, no, that's too much. Huh? Uh, but I'll skip that and go back to the deduction about his fortunes being in decline. W where do you see that? This hat is three years old. Mm, so you say? These flat brims curled at the edge were fashionable then, but not since. It's a hat of the very best quality. Look at the band of ribbed silk and the excellent lining. If this man could afford to buy so expensive a hat three years ago and could afford none since, then assuredly he's gone down in the world. <laughs> so obvious when you expect it. <clears throat> How about the foresight and the moral retrogression? <laughs> Here's the foresight, Watson. This little disc and the loop which secures the hat against the wind. They never sold with hats. This man ordered one, showing a certain amount of foresight, since he went out of his way to take this precaution against the wind. But the elastic's broken. Precisely, Watson. It's broken, and he hasn't troubled to replace it, although it's cheap and easy enough to have done. Therefore, he has less foresight than formerly. Oh, I can't see that. Why isn't it that he, he just doesn't care? Impossible. He's tried to conceal some of the stains on the hat by daubing them with ink, so he hasn't entirely lost his self-respect. Huh. Well, I, I suppose you deduce that he's middle-aged, recently had his hair cut, and uses lime cream from an examination of some stray hairs found in the hat. Good, Watson. If you use the lens on the lower lining, you will find a number of hairs clean-cut by the scissors of the barber. Huh. There's a distinct odor of lime cream, and the hairs are adhesive. Yes, yes, fine. Uh, but the sedentary life. The dust on the hat, Watson. Not the gritty gray dust of the street, but the fluffy brown dust of the house. The hat has been hung indoors most of the time. But, but his wife, uh, you said that she'd ceased to love him. This hat hasn't been brushed for weeks. When I see you, my dear fellow, with a week's accumulation of dust upon your hat, and when your wife allows you to go out in such a state, 
I shall fear that you also have been unfortunate enough to lose your wife's affection. My word. Well, he, he might be a bachelor. Doctor. Doctor, you forget. He was bringing the bird home as a peace offering to his wife. Remember the card on the bird's leg? <sighs> Fair enough. But you will admit that you were guessing when you said he was without gaslight. Not at all, not at all. One tallow stain on a hat, even two, may come about by chance. But when I see no less than five, I think there can be very little doubt that the individual must come into frequent contact with burning tallow. Can you not see him, Watson, walking upstairs at night after a drinking bout? With his hat in one hand and a guttering candle in the other. Well, <laughs> come, my old friend. You must admit he never got tallow stains from a gas jet. <laughs> Joe, if you, you have an answer to everything. But all of this seems to be rather a waste of energy. The goose. Mr. Holmes, the goose. Well, what of it? Has it returned to life and flapped off through the kitchen window? See here, sir. See what my wife found in its crop. By Joe, Peterson, that's treasure trove indeed. I suppose you know what you've got. The diamonds. Precious stone. Mm, it's more than a precious stone. It's the precious stone. By Jove. The Cultus of Morka's blue carbuncle. Close eye, Doctor. I see you've been reading the advertisements in the Times also. There's a reward of 1,000 pounds, and that's not within a 20th of its market price. 1,000 pounds? Mm. I'd have to go right off to the police with it. Mm -mm. No, no. You leave the stone with me, and I'll see that you'll get the reward. And what will I tell my wife? What did you tell her before you came here? Well, that I was off to see you and then to the body. Tell her the truth. That you wanted to go to the police, but I was the one who wouldn't have it. The moment Peterson left, Holmes took the magnificent blue carbuncle and packed it very carefully and left Baker Street saying that he would return shortly... And if I cared to continue pursuing the answer to this puzzle, I, I, I should wait for him. Well, needless to say, I waited. Uh, who, who is it? Inspector Lestrade. <laughs> Lestrade. Uh, come in. It, it's been a long time since we've met. Where's uh, Holmes? Well, I've no idea. He told me to wait for him. I, I expect him any moment. Ah. Uh, you... <laughs> Have some little problem you think my friend can help you with? Yeah, this time the show's on the other foot, Doctor. It's Mr. Holmes who has the problem. Well, I don't understand. But I'm afraid your friend Holmes has made a serious mistake. Ah, there, Lestrade. I was expecting you. There's no doubt you were. I'm here to inform you that I have a warrant for your arrest, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> has happened. Sherlock Holmes under arrest. Now, we all know that Lestrade isn't the most brilliant officer at Scotland Yard, but he's honest and slow-moving. He also has a warrant, so it isn't Lestrade alone who believes Holmes is guilty of a crime. I'll continue with Act Two shortly. best of us cherish small victories. Although Sir Arthur Conan Doyle doesn't mention it, I suspect that Lestrade, so often proved wrong by the astute Sherlock Holmes, must have felt a measure of satisfaction when he placed the brilliant detective under arrest. Let's continue now and hear Holmes' reaction. <laughs> come, Lestrade. Come, come. What is the charge? Being in possession of stolen property. Uh, you refer, of course, to the Countess of Morker's blue carbuckle. Oh, so you admit it. Nonsense. But how would you know what I was talking about unless... Because you... I know righteous women, Inspector. Meaning Mrs. Peterson? Now you'll admit that's where you got your information from, won't you? It's nothing to be ashamed of. She's an honest, law-abiding citizen who... Who reacted predictably and as I foresaw when her husband told her I kept the stone and asked her not to inform the police. Oh, uh... Now, here, read this note, which, as you will see, is upon the Countess of Morker's own stationery and written in her hand. As I say, from Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Esquire, the blue carbuncle, which was stolen from my suite at the Hotel Cosmopolitan upon the 22nd of December. I have given Mr. Holmes my bank check for £1,000, made out to Mr. Peter Peterson, who was responsible for the finding of the gem. 
Signed, Helena Marchetti's Countess of Morka. So, Inspector, I am not in possession of any stolen property, but I've returned it to its rightful owner and will shortly deliver the reward to Peterson. Oh. Now, I want your word to keep this matter of the recovery of the carbuncle secret. But why? Because it's necessary that the man who stole it still believes that it's missing. Oh, we have the thief. I doubt that you have the right man. Aha, uh-huh. so that's the way the wind blows. Once again, you're going to fly in the face of the evidence. The evidence being? Now, it's clear enough. This fellow, John Horner, is a plumber. He was working in the dressing room of the Countess, soldering the second bar of the grate, which was loose. Horner was shown to the room by the upper floor attendant of the Cosmopolitan named James Ryder. Didn't he stay with him? Well, for some time he did. But then he was called away. And when he returned, Horner had disappeared. A bureau had been forced open and a small Morocco casket lay empty upon the dressing table. Ryder instantly gave the alarm. Uh Uh-huh, and Horner was then arrested in his lodgings, found to have been convicted on a previous robbery charge, and is now awaiting trial. That's it. What makes you think we don't have the right man? Uh, Several things. First, can you tell me how the stone went from Horner into the crop of the goose which Mrs. Peterson was cooking? Uh, Not a moment, Uh, no doubt we'll find that out when he confesses. But so far, he strongly protests his innocence. Yes, they all do. Mm-hmm. Another question which occurs to me is, how did Horner know exactly where the Countess kept the gem? But it seems to me that these are questions that his defense counsel might raise at his trial. But since I'm a police officer, I don't think I have to answer them. Well, suppose that I'm in position of finding a link in the chain. Would you then agree to keep the recovery of the stone quiet? It all depends on whether you're off on some flight of fancy. Or... I know for a fact, as you do, that the stone was in the crop of a goose in the possession of Mrs. Peterson. I also know that before it came into her possession, it was carried by a Mr. Henry Smith. I propose to locate this Mr. Smith and find out what part he played in this little mystery. And if I agree... How do you intend to do that? By the simplest means possible, an advertisement in the newspapers. And so it was agreed. Lestrade left, an advertisement was placed reading, Found at the corner of Good Street, a goose and a black felt hat. Mr. Henry Smith can have, same by applying at 6.30 this evening at 221B Baker Street. I did my professional rounds the next day, but was back at Holmes flat at six o'clock. My friend was waiting for me, lounging on the sofa in a purple dressing gown, thoughtfully staring at a plump white goose, which was conspicuous on the sideboard. He waved at it and said, Isn't that a fine-looking bird, Watson? Ha! <laughs> Makes my mouth water. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> but I presume we're not going to have the pleasure of eating it. Correct. If we receive an answer to our advertisement, this bird will put us a lot farther along the trail to the answer we seek. Well, you think Horner innocent? Oh, that's putting the shade too strongly. I'd rather say that the police have accepted all evidence at face value and made no effort to answer the questions I put to Lestrade here yesterday. However, Mrs. Hudson is preparing our dinner, which we shall have at seven, unless we're interrupted. Before we could start dinner, there was a knock at the door. I opened it to admit a tall man in a scotch bonnet with a coat buttoned up to his chin. Holmes rose from the sofa to greet him. Ah, Mr. Henry Smith, I believe. Oh, yes, that's my name. Pray take this chair by the fire, Mr. Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr. Holmes. It is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, isn't it? Yes, and this is Dr. Watson. Uh, I do. Well, I don't mean to be impertinent, but I'm at a loss to understand how a man of your reputation comes to be involved in a matter concerning a goose and a hat. This is your hat, sir. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Thank you. But since you know my identity, you must also know my disposition for observation and oblige me by putting it on. Uh, Of course. Hmm, a perfect fit. Well, sir, we've retained these things for you for some days because we were looking... For an advertisement from you, giving your address. Well, shillings aren't so plentiful with me as they once were. I believe that a gang of roughs who assaulted me had made off with both my hat and the bird. 
I didn't care to spend more money in a hopeless attempt to recover them. Quite so. Oh, by the way, about the bird, we were compelled to eat it. Oh. To eat it? Yes, I'm sure that you understand it would have been of no use to anyone had we kept it here for this length of time. Oh, yes, yes, I can see that. However, would this other goose upon the sideboard, which is about the same weight and perfectly fresh, be a suitable replacement for the one you lost? Oh, well, that's, that's very handsome of you, Mr. Holmes, and I'll be very happy with this bird. Uh, oh, 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 one, one more thing. We still have the feathers, legs, and crop of your own bird, if you wish to... Uh... <laughs> well, outside of serving as reminders of my adventure, I see no earthly use for them. So with your kind permission, I'll just take this excellent bird and be running along. Oh, one moment, by the way. You see, I'm somewhat of a fowl fancier, and I've seldom seen a better-grown goose than the one that you lost. Would you mind telling me where you bought it? Oh, not at all. A few of us frequent the Alpha Inn near the museum. Well, this year, our good host started a, a goose club, <laughs> the purpose of which was to see that all of us, by paying a few pence a week, would each receive a fine goose at Christmas. Well, the rest you know. And once again, gentlemen, my thanks. The door had not long closed on Mr. Smith. Before Holmes turned to me and said, It's quite certain our friend Smith knows nothing of the matter. Are you hungry, Watson? No, not particularly. Then I suggest that we turn our dinner into a late supper and follow up this clue while it's hot. Or perhaps we could even get a bite at the Alpha whilst we chat to the landlord. One glass of beer with the genial landlord of the Alpha elicited the information that he'd purchased Smith's goose, along with the others, for the club, from a Covent Garden dealer named Breckenridge. When we reached his stall, he was about to put up the shutters for the night. Mm, good evening, Mr. Breckenridge. Uh, Cold night. You must have some reason to be out in it. No, I see you sold out of geese. Well, let's have 500 tomorrow morning. I'm mm. afraid that won't do. Well, there's some in the store yonder with a gas flare. Ah, oh, yes, but you were particularly recommended to me. Who oh, by? By the landlord of the Alpha. Oh, yeah, yeah. I sent him a couple of dozen. Fine birds they were, too. Now, where do you get them? Now, then, mister, out with it, and you'd better make it straight. Well, straight enough. I should like to know who sold you the geese you supplied to the Alpha. And I'm not telling you. Now be off. Why should you be so warm over a trifle? If you were as pestered lately as I am, you'd be warm too. When I pay good money for a good article, there should be an end of the business. But every day it's, where are the geese? Who did you sell the geese to? And what would you take for the geese? Then I have no connection with other people who've been making inquiries. Uh, but I'm always willing to back my opinion on a matter of fowls, and I have a fiver on it that the bird I ate is a country uh, bird. Then you lost a fiver for its town bread. It's nothing of the kind. Uh, you think you know more about fowls than I, who handle them ever since I've been a nipper? Uh. I'll tell you that all those birds went to the Alpha were town bred. You'll never get me to believe that. Ah, uh, now. <laughs> Since you seem to be a betting man, would you care to make a wager on the matter? Oh, I'd just be taking your money. But to teach you not to be obstinate, I'll put a sovereign against you. <laughs> you may as well hand me the sovereign now. Bill, bring me the books. And when I have a Mr. Coxall, I'll prove to you that there's still one goose left in my shop, and that's you. <laughs> well, thank you, Bill. Now, this book lists the names of all the folk from whom I buy. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, yeah. On this page here are mm -hmm. the country folk, and their numbers after their names are where their accounts are on the big ledger. Now, then... Uh, ah. You see this page in red ink? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a list of my town supplies. Now, look at the third name and read it out to me. Mrs. Oakshot. 117 Brixton Road, 249. Just so. Now, turn that up in the big ledger. Mm -hmm. that, that, that. Now, you have it. Read that last entry. December 22. 24 geese at 7 shillings sixpence. There you are. 
Underneath. Uh huh. Sold to Mr. Windergate of the Alpha at twelve shillings. <laughs> what have you to say now? Ah, well, what can I say? Here. Here's your sovereign. <laughs> well, that's the last time I take a bet with a tradesman. Come on, Martin. Uh, huh. You were fortunate that you managed to get him to wager with your house. Not fortunate. Observant. When you see a man with whiskers of that cut, with a pink betting slip protruding from his pocket, the odds are all in your favor that he can be drawn by a bet. If I'd put 100 pounds down before him, I'd never have gotten such complete information as he gave me because he thought he was getting the best of a wager. I've had enough of you and your geese. Huh. Any more talk of geese and I'll set the door with Come, you. Watson, come. Right. I didn't buy the geese off you. But one of them was mine all the same. We'd like a word with you. Come on, Watson. Right. The fellow's taken to his heels. Uh, uh, George, that chap runs like a hare. He won't get away. And it'll be worth your while to talk with us. Tell the smasher that I can't give him what I ain't got. But I'm still trying. A famous nursery rhyme about the theft of a goose goes in part like this. John, John, the gray goose is gone, and the fox is off to his den. Although not strictly applicable in this Sherlock Holmes tale, because we're not sure who the fox is... Nevertheless, we'll track him to his den when we continue with Act Three. Everyone's familiar with the phrase, your goose is cooked. In the adventure of the Blue Carbuncle, the cooking of the goose marked the beginning rather than the finish of a story. We pick up Sherlock Holmes and the faithful Watson hot on the trail of a man who's also interested in the whereabouts of the cooked goose, which was the receptacle for the world-famous Blue Carbuncle. It's useless. It's useless, Watson. We've lost him. Time to stop using our feet and start employing our brains. I'm happy to know that, Holmes, because to tell the truth, I'm, I'm not in the best of shape for running through the streets of London. What do we do? Mm -hmm. Follow up two clues that have been given to us. The Smasher is an infamous name in the London underworld. Oh. I have ways of reaching him, and... And Mrs. Oakshaw? No, not quite yet. We've discovered where the goose was grown. Now, I think we should set about checking where it fed. I left my friend to go to my home, but made an appointment to have dinner with him the following night. Much to my surprise, when I arrived, I found Inspector Lestrade of the yard, sitting opposite Holmes. Lestrade had a long face. Watson, the inspector's superiors at Scotland Yard are expressing some concern over the fact that they may look foolish if it turns out that they have once again arrested the wrong man. They're much more concerned over our rowdy disturbance at the Hotel Cosmopolitan this morning. Hmm. What has that to do with me? Now, cap off it, Mr. Holmes. I know what a marvel you are at disguises, and I'll bet my last copper that you were one of those toughs that got into a disgraceful brawl in front of the hotel today. Indeed, Inspector. And can you advance any reason why I should be involved in such a fracas? Because you're still poking around about the Countess of Moorcar's blue carbuncle. Well, I'm convinced Horner is innocent, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to marshal enough facts for you to render me some assistance. Ah, you admit you need our help. In this matter, definitely. And uh, what do we get out of it? I think I can promise to save you and the yard some embarrassment in the matter of the man now in jail. Uh, first, I'd like to know what you want from us. I want you to pick up the smasher. The smasher? Mm-hmm. On what charge? Doesn't matter. Anything that will hold him overnight. Use the brawl at the Cosmopolitan. Uh, he wasn't there. But two of his boys were. Ah, so you were the other man. Uh, that's of no, no moment now. What is important is that the smasher should be out of the way tonight. Why? Do you think this smasher took the carbuncle? At the moment, I have only suspicions. What I do know is that the smasher is involved. Else, why would two of his tops be posted at the Cosmopolitan Uh, Most of the people who stay at the Cosmopolitan are wealthy. The smasher might have had some other reason. Granted. But the fight didn't start until they found out someone else was inquiring about Mr. James Ryder. 
Oh? Ah. Who quite coincidentally called in sick today? He was not at work. Martin he have been really ill? If my theory is correct, he is ill of fright. I think Mr. Ryder knows something that the smasher wants to know. And that knowledge has frightened him half to death. After some grumbling and a promise from Holmes that the yard could release the smasher the first thing in the morning, Lestrade agreed. Holmes and I immediately set out for Ryder's lodgings, which weren't too far from Mrs. Oakshot's address in Brixton Lane. Ryder had a room tucked away at the top floor of a small house at the end of a mews. As we approached it, Holmes warned me... Now, keep a sharp eye out for anyone loitering around the entrance, Watson. Uh, you think the smasher has some of his men watching the house? Well, I think it's a distinct possibility. I'm not concerned about them watching. I just don't want them preventing us from entering. Ah, there they are. Oh, yes. Follow my lead now. I don't want you getting any wrong ideas now, mister. My sister's a very refined gal. Not the sort you can play tricks with. She's used to gentlemen. You understand? Uh, uh, you told me all that in the pub. But I don't have any wrong ideas. I'll behave in a proper fashion. We weren't challenged as we entered. And whilst we were climbing the stairs, <laughs> Holmes complimented me. You did well out on the street, Watson. <laughs> Just enough to throw them off the scent if they had instructions to stop anyone who might be looking for Mr. James Ryder. Here we are. Who's there? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Open up. What do you want? I can be of assistance to you in the matter that's troubling you. Well, 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 what do you know about it? I know everything about it. How do I know this is a trick to get me to open you're interested in geese, or rather one goose, white, with a black bar across its tail, which was sold to Mr. Windigert of the Alpha Inn, and given by him to Mr. Henry Smith. Oh, sir, you're the very man I've longed to meet. I can hardly tell you how interested I am in this matter. Well, come in quickly. These elaborate precautions for your safety won't be necessary, Ryder. The smasher's in jail, and that's where you'll be very shortly... Unless you tell me the few things I need to know to make my case complete. Oh, for Lord's sake, have mercy, sir. Don't have me thrown in jail. Think of my father. Think of my mother. Oh, please, sir, have mercy. I am thinking of John Horner, the innocent man you put in the dock for a crime he didn't commit. Well, I'll leave the country. I, I won't give evidence against him. But then the charge will be dropped. We shall see. First, I will tell you that I have almost every link in my hands and all the proofs a prosecutor would need. So I'll be able to check you if you lie. Oh, I promise, sir. You shall have it all. Very well. Now, you decided to steal the stone. When and why? Well, I... I wanted to get married. You see, Catherine Cusack and... Mm, her ladyship's waiting me. Oh, yes. Well, mm. we... Well, I was mad for her. And, and she said the only way she'd have me was if we had a nest egg to set aside. Then she told me where the Countess kept the gem. But I could see no way for us to get it and, and not be suspected until I heard about Honor. Indeed, Ryder, there's the making of a very pretty villain in you. When you learned that Horner, the plumber, had been mixed up in some such matter before, you laid your plans. You and your confederate created some small job in my lady's room knowing that Horner should be sent for. He did the job, left, then you rifled the jewel case, raised the alarm, and had the poor soul arrested. Yes. All this I know. Now, how came the stone into the goose, and the goose into the open market, and how did the smasher get into the picture? The truth now, but that's your only hope. But after Horner had been arrested, it seemed to me I'd best get away with his stone at once. For I was afraid the police might take it into their heads to search me and my room. A pity they didn't. Well, I wish it had never happened. Believe me, it was the first time, and I was really in a sweat. I left the hotel, as if on some errand. 
and went to my cousin's house. Now, she lived in Brixton Road, where she fattens fowls for market. When I got there, she asked me what was wrong, because I was so pale and in a sweat despite the cold. Well, I told her I had been upset about the robbery in the hotel. Then I went into the backyard and smoked a pipe and wondered what was the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. And that was when you got the idea about the goose. No, 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 not at first. I was thinking about how to turn the stone into money. I knew I'd have to have help, and, and that's when I thought of the smasher. But I just couldn't face the idea of going on into the street again with the stone in my pocket. Well, I saw the geese waddling about, and I remembered my cousin had promised me to pick up her geese for a Christmas present. Mm -hmm. Then it was then that you got the ingenious idea of secreting the stone in the goose. Well, well Mr. Holmes, I was sure I'd found a perfect hiding place. I drove one of the birds behind a little shed in the yard, cut it, and pried its bill open, and pushed the stone down its gullet as far as my fingers could reach. The bird gave a gulp. And I knew it had swallowed the stone. But the creature flapped and struggled and... And out came my cousin to see what was the matter. As I turned to speak to her, the bird broke loose and fled off among the others. Ah, uh -huh. So you were, so to speak, a gone goose. Well, I didn't think so at the time. My cousin had picked out another bird for me, but I remembered the bird I had. A, a big white one with a barred tail. And I insisted that that was the one I wanted. Had you kept your eye on it? Well, as well as I could. My cousin was a little hot because I wouldn't take the bird. They'd expressly fatten for me. But anyway, she told me to go ahead and take my bird and turned and went back into the house. Mm -hmm. So you wasted no time, but slaughtered the bird, and then? Well, then I slung it over my shoulder and went about getting to see the smasher. I'd heard of him about the hotel. So you're the shrimp what's been asking for me, eh? Yeah? All right, now. What's it all about? Well, I... I, uh... I've got something I want to dispose of. Yeah. Something hot, eh? Huh? I, well, I... I guess so. It's... Well... You lifted something. Well, yeah, as you might say. I that. want to know how you heard about me. You know a man named Mon Lee? Of course I do. He's doing five to ten in Pentonville. How do you know Maudley? Well, he used to work where I do. The Hotel Cosmopolitan. Don't tell me you're the bloke what pinched that there uh, blue carbuncle of the Countess. <laughs> I am. Well, now, maybe there's more to you than meets the eye. You got it with you? Yes. Let's have a look. Uh, no, hold on a minute. You have to understand, this is... Well, I'm... I'm not really experienced at this sort of deal. How does it work? <laughs> like clotter cream. Smooth as a whistle. 70% for me and 30 for you. Well, well, that seems like an awful lot for you. Look, mate, I'm the one who's taken all the risks. Now, let me see the stone. Where is it? Right, yeah? In the goose. In the... <laughs> Like I said before, maybe there's more to you than appears on the surface. Yeah, take me knife. Oh, thank you. Now, it should be right here. In the crop. Yeah, what kind of a game are you trying to play, shrimp? Well, well it's got to be here. Uh, I've got to go down. I know it's here. Stop missing about with that bird and tell me what you really did with the stone. Oh, well, it's been a mistake. I must have taken the wrong bird. I'll say there's been a mistake. <laughs> Let me go. I know the rights of you. You didn't like the split. So you're thinking of talking to Tyndall. Oh, 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 no, 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 no. I never heard of Tyndall, I swear. I just got the wrong bird. Yeah. It won't let me go. I'll go back to my cousins and get the right one. Oh. All right, mate. Oh. Maybe you're giving it to me straight. Uh, you run back to wherever you got this bird and get the right one. But from now on, the boys will be watching you every blessed minute. I'll be back inside an hour. You'll see. I, I promise. And when you got back to your cousins, the goose was gone. You got it, sir. And I've been out of my mind trying to trace the bird and stay away from the smasher. Now, that's the whole story. Say, 
What's going to happen to me? Well, if you do as I say, much less than you deserve. Oh, sir, I'll do anything. Anything. Now, first you will tell Catherine Cusack to hand in her notice to the Countess. Oh, I will. I swear. And then you will leave the country. Oh, I will, but but the smasher... We'll lose all interest in you when he discovers that you don't have the gem. Oh, God bless you, sir. I swear that I... No more words. No more words before I change my mind. Come, Watson. We have to keep our word with Lestrade. After informing Lestrade that he could release the smasher and that the case against Horner would be quietly dropped when no witness would testify, Holmes and I were walking slowly back toward Baker Street. <laughs> he must have read my thoughts because he said... And don't be disturbed because you think I've compounded a felony by not handing Ryder over to the police. Holmes, <laughs> By Jove, how did you know what I was thinking? My dear friend, your face is an open book. Oh, well, but look at it this way. We have saved an innocent man, and perhaps also a soul. This rider is too frightened to go wrong again. And after all, it is Christmas, the season of forgiveness. <laughs> when you put it that way, I, I confess it makes me feel better. And since we pass whites on our way back, why don't we drop in for dinner? I have a ridiculous craving for roast goose. So it seems that Charles Dickens isn't the only English writer who wrote a Christmas story. Although I'll admit that Ebenezer Scrooge is better known than Sherlock Holmes for celebrating the spirit of Christmas. I'll be back shortly. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote a number of stories which didn't involve Sherlock Holmes and one notable novel, The White Company. It's been a well-kept secret that he collaborated with Sir James Barry of Peter Pan fame on an operetta. I wish, although I know it's in vain, that someday someone would put it on so that we could see just what kind of librettist Doyle was. Our cast included Kevin McCarthy, Court Benson, William Griffiths, and Lloyd Batista. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. He's recently moved here from New York, hasn't adapted to the diplomatic way of doing things. Well, let's get this over with. Okay. Come in, Sergeant. I think I've got our first real lead. Miss Reed? No, no, forget her. She's the scrupulous type. Drives 40 miles to return fountain pens. It's Lomas. I see. First, you want me to put a tail on Miss Reed and check Simpson's bank account, and now it's Lomas. I think he knew Simpson was going to shoot himself. The case is closed, Fritz. What? It's closed, Sergeant Mangle. Who's this? This is Barney Judd. He's from the Department of Defense. The Pentagon. So what gives? You mean you guys are taking over the investigation? There is no more investigation, Sergeant. But you got to listen to me. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour allergy capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.